study assignment. Um, but other than that, I, I don't give a lot of homework. Yeah, I've got enough studying that it's plenty to keep you busy. Where are the chapters for the reading right now of what we're doing? Oh, is that, is that not, is that on the is that not in the syllabus? I I know it's in the third syllabus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's one well, fifteen. It's possible it's not on there. <laughs> well, you're about tentative schedule up on Blackboard. Yeah, that's going to be close. Yeah, that's and that's why it's so tentative. <laughs> I never get through the things in the first day. Yeah, I think it's one fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> it took a lot of slides. You just, it's, it's a knack. It's just one of those things, I can't get it, I can't get it, I can't get it. And they're like, oh, hey, look at that, I can do it. <laughs> okay, all you're gonna do, you just put the blood on the slide and you spread it out, just like that. We'll be doing that next week. Characteristics of a good spear and having a, just like we talked about yesterday with having a bad specimen, clotted, hemolyzed, whatever. If you don't have a good smear, doing a diff is going to be miserable. Um, I know Jean told me that before she came here, and even most of the time she did stuff, the, the only diff students did were ones they made themselves, which is questionable to begin with, and then hand stained. So they didn't see abnormals. I mean, it, it, and they're not the best smears. I saw some of the ones they had in the file. I'm like, I would never read this. So this is the first step. You have to have good ingredients to get a good meal. So we have to get a good smear to start with. It should cover the full width of the slide. Um, I am working on a collection of the ugliest slides I've ever seen. And I have one I can't duplicate. She makes them, and I swear they are a quarter of an inch wide. I can't make them that way. I don't know how she does it. I've tried repeatedly, but it's just like one little streak down the middle. How do you read that? It's like, boop, 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 boop. That's not all. So it should be at least three quarters of the width. You want it to be half to three quarters of the length. You don't want it going off the end because we're going to be reading. This is our sweet spot. This is where we want to be reading our slide. And you don't want this to be here. Okay? So you need to have enough space to look at. It should be light pink to oranges until we stain it. Okay? It should be thin enough to read through. And that means if I set it on a piece of paper, I should be able to distinguish that there are letters behind it. Not necessarily I could read what those letters are, but you don't want it real thick. Okay? Uh, it should be very smooth without ridges or streaks, and you're going to find out, oh, it's just a little tiny streak. It should be fine. And you get under the microscope, and it's like the Grand Canyon. Okay, so little things. You're going to be looking at these at 1,000 magnification. So even small imperfections are going to create a large piece. Okay. And don't worry, we have some tricks for this. Troubleshooting, I'm not going to go over this too much. I'm going to hit... The ones that are very important to remember. If it's too thick, the ones you want to remember, polycythemia just means many cells in the blood. So you got somebody who's got a high red count. The most common people we see with this problem are babies. Babies can be born with a red count of six or seven. It's not uncommon. So the blood's a lot thicker. So the key to this you want to remember is to make it thinner you want your spreader slide at a low angle. So your spreader slide's the one that goes on top. So if you want it to be thinner, you bring it down. If you want it to be thicker, you raise it up. Practice is the only way you get the hang of this. Yeah? How often do you hemolyze the blood on your skin? Never. Okay. Nope, doesn't work that way. Okay? Um, unless you have something funky, under, unless you like wash your slides with alcohol or water, and don't let them dry. It's the only thing I can think of. Um, if it's too long, well, you either put too much blood on there or you had it at too long an angle. Honestly, guys, the only way to learn to do this, I'm going to give you a tube of blood. I'm going to give you a pack of slides. Melissa and I are going to walk around and everybody's got their own, their own way of doing it. Okay. And on the opposite end of it, if I've got somebody who's got anemia or a really low red count, they're not going to have a lot of cells. It's going to be very runny, very thin, and it's going to swoosh right off the end of the slide before you know it. So what you have to do then is raise the angle of the slide to make the slide shorter. Okay. Other than the angle of the slide and how it, how it relates to how to make it shorter and longer and how to deal with high blood and low blood volumes, uh, there's not going to be a lot of test questions on that. Wavy, 
Some of them look like, I don't know where y'all are driving, but they're, they're very fun. Basically, you're going too slow. This is fast. That The video, the little uh, animation I had at the beginning, that's way too slow. Literally, two seconds, done. Okay. Holes in it. Um, around here, it's probably because the sides are dirty. Okay. Um, tails beyond the edge. Or if you've got a lot of streaks or runs in it, sometimes if your spreader slide has got chips on the end, it'll leave imperfections in it. Um, if the thick part washes off, it's not allowed to dry long enough. And we have one person at work who makes them, and she uses this huge blob of drip, drop of blood, and then she pats it off to get the most of it off. By the time she gets done, she's only got this much at the end to read. So we'll, we'll learn how to do it. It's not that tough. We're going to fix the blood to the slide with methanol. Does anybody know what fixing cells to the slide means? What are we doing? Sticking. Making we're them not stick. using heat, we're using chemical. Making them stick. Making them stick. And the way we're doing that with methanol, why? Anyone think of why we would use methanol? What would, what? It doesn't damage the cells. It doesn't damage the cells, that's true. But what is it going to do to them? What is alcohol? What is its effectiveness? What does it do? It dehydrates. So it's going to pull all the water out of the slide so you have a non hydrous slide, uh, cell and that's going to stick, stick to the slide. So when we stain it, all of the blood that's on the slide isn't going to wash off. Okay? We're going to use a polychromatic stain. And as you probably found out in medical terminology, if you know what all the little pieces mean, these great big super fancy words, just fancy way of saying the easy stuff. What's poly mean? Mm -hmm. What's chrome mean? Color. Whew. Many color stain. Doesn't that sound all fancy by that, okay? So a poly, it's a polychromatophilic or poly, polychromatic stain. It is technically a modified Romanowski stain. The one we most usually use is the right stain or a right gimsa. And the easiest way to remember that we use the right stain is you don't want to use the wrong stain. Okay. I told you they get stupider as we go along, believe it. I can really be dumb. And we where I work, I work hard at it. It's made of basically two stains. The first is our methylene blue. That is going to stain my RNA and my DNA. Okay. So any of my genetic material is going to stain with the blue stain. That is a good test question. Eosin is my acidic stain, and it's going to stain my hemoglobin and my eosinophil, hence the name. If I put on the test what stains the eosinophils, and you can't figure out eosin, we need to talk. Um, and then the buffer is just another background stain. This is actually not in all of the stains. This is in the right pizza. But methylene blue and eosin are my two primary stains. Okay. Basically, and I love doing this when I'm at a youth health fair, the red cells are going to be red and the white cells are going to be, and all the kids go white and I go purple. Psych. All right. So what we're going to have is we're going to have our red stain, our red cells should be red. If they're not red, stain it again. Okay. Our white cells are going to be much less common. And they're going to be a variety of colors. But the nucleus is going to be a fairly nice purple. Okay. The way we look at a smear, and we are going to do one of these together on the camera scope first. They replaced our projectors last semester. Oh my gosh, you can see. Oh, they're awesome. I can really torment you. Um, but what we're going to do, we want to find what I call the Cinderella area. You don't want it too thick. You don't want it too thin. You want it to be just right. You want where the cells are just beginning to touch. You don't want them all globbed together because they're going to squish the white, white cells. I mean, it's just physics. If you've got a bunch of them, they're going to squish those cells. And you're not going to be able to see the morphology. And you really need to be able to see the morphology. And what is morphology? The shape. The shape. The shape. 
okay, what it looks like. Okay. We're going to focus it under 100x. We are going to be using oil. Have you guys used oil before? You did, okay. So you know not to drag the 40 through the oil, right? Okay. We've lost more objectives to that than anything else. And you don't need like a ton. Just need a just a little, a little drop, yeah. And you need to make sure you clean that off of your scope every single day, because otherwise it gets nasty. Okay, obviously this smear has been stained, because now it's not orange, it's blue. Okay. When we're counting, what we're going to do, and we're going to do this under the microscope, we want to find, here's the edge, this is going to be our too thin, our just right area is going to start somewhere in here. What you want to do is you want to move over. You don't want to go all the way to the edge because a lot of times these edges are overlapped and some of the larger cells get kind of spread out to there, but it messes with the morphology and they look funky. Okay, so we want to try and stay in the middle of the set of this field. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go down one. When we get to the edge, we're going to move over one microscopic field and then move back. And I'll show you how we do this when we get it on the scope and you're going to go back and forth. One thing that I always insist on is you really should start at the thinner edge and work thicker. Because if I start here, which some of my uh, co-workers do, and work out, if I run out of cells, I'm sort of out of luck, right? If I work from the inside, outside in, I can get into a deeper area, which isn't ideal for counting cells, but at least I'll have enough to find. Okay, so you do want to work from the thin area to the thick, and you do want to tack back and forth. Characteristics of a properly stained smear. Red cells are pink. Platelets are kind of purple and blue. The nucleus of the white cell should be in a deep purple, and basically, our granulocytes, and we'll talk a lot about this in just a moment, our segs and our neutrophils are going to be kind of pinkish. Every stain's a little different onto exactly what it looks like, and we'll, we'll handle that also. These are our basophils, big blo black blobs. Eosinophils, which are real pretty orange. Everybody likes eosinophils. I have a couple slides that are like almost all egos. Oh, is that pretty? Don't ask me why. Again, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on this. This is something that you should be able to keep in the back of your mind, but most of it's just common sense and experience. So if it's too blue, I mean, it just kind of makes sense. You stained it too much. Okay, if everything's too blue, you left it in the blue stain too long. We do a manual procedure where you, you dip it in the methanol, and then after it's fixed, you dip it like three, what about five times in the orange and three times in the blue and you're done. That's it. I mean, it, it doesn't take very long to stain these. Okay? Um, again, pretty much just know that if it's too blue, you stained it too long. That's about the only thing you, you're going to remember anyway. Okay. Things that are on the slide that should not be on the slide, we refer to as artifacts. Okay? And that's spelled just like the regular word. An artifact is something that is not clinically significant because it is just a side effect of the slide making process of some sort. Okay? If we have precipitate, and I will tell you, I have this picture pretty much every semester. Somebody tells me it's platelet clumps or whatever. This is junk. It is garbage. It is blech. It is precipitate from the stain. It is nothing significant. Okay? If you start seeing all of your slides have a lot of this, you need to either filter your stain or get new stain. And around here, get new. We have enough for the next three decades. Okay? Um, moth eaten red cells. This is what we're kind of talking about here this kind of shiny horseshoe around the center area and it will be very refractile. It will be shiny. When you focus up and down, it'll almost glow at you. All that means is you didn't let the slide dry totally before you went and stained it. So 
when you put it in the methanol, it didn't get some of the water out of this portion of the cell. Okay, that's all that is. It wasn't fixed properly. Why do I have a scratch on here? Because I've had students confuse it with fibrin strands. No, it's a scratch. There's nothing in it. It's totally blank. You can definitively see it has nice sharp edges. In a fibrin strand, it's going to have, it's going to look like a web. It's going to look more like mucus. Okay? It's going to look like little strands woven together. This next one is a necrobiotic cell. Necrobiotic being dying or dead. A lot of times we'll see these if the blood is too old when we made the cell. We also will see these in certain conditions and I will point those out as we go along. How do I tell this necrobiotic? My lobes are no longer connected and my dots are really, really dense and really, really dark. Rouleau, and this is not true Rouleau, I just went too thick in the smear to the picture. Okay. Um, what happens in Rouleau is you have an increased protein, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. But the increased protein keeps the red cells, it gets it glue, it stick, makes them stick together. Yes? Did you, the slide that you're doing right now, did you, I'm sorry, did you update the one down the computer? Are you missing that one on yours? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we have this. It just doesn't have the scratch on it. Yeah, it's got the other two. It's got the other, but it doesn't have the scratch. I, I, yeah, I, I told you there's going to be some minor edits that, I, that I've made. That's, that's not a big one. It'll be in the artifacts PowerPoint that I give you guys for review. Okay. Um, but the protein, and the neat thing about red cells is when they stack up because of the increased protein, it's like poker chips. They literally stack in stacks, just like poker. In fact, is if you get a urine that's got a really high protein and a lot of red cells, you can put it under the microscope and you can see them kind of floating around and you can kind of see them stacking up. I'm easily amused. Um, Prenated red cells? That simply means that the edges are not round and smooth. These are almost all the time artifact. There are a couple of conditions where these would be clinically significant, but pretty much it's just a matter of you didn't let it dry properly. You want to let it dry on its own, you know, waiting it in the air, and for goodness sake, don't blow on it. Okay, don't blow on it. Right. It can also be, when it's really hot and humid and sticky, sometimes they just don't. How am I going to tell significant birth cells from cremated cells? I'm going to make another slide and verify their presence. Again, troubleshooting. This area is too thick. This area is too thin. And we are going to go over that when we get into lab. I'm not going to go over the slide by one. We're going to actually do these in lab. And I will tell you there is a PowerPoint in at the end of this stuff that talks about lab tests. It's only, I've got it all written down for you so you don't have to take notes when we're in lab. I will not be actually going over those PowerPoints. It's all there just so that I, you don't have to feel like oh, I've got to take notes in lab too. It's all written down for you. Okay. We'll discuss this as we go along. Again, this is just so I have it written down for you at some point. We're going to count 100 cells and figure out the percentage. Well, if I count 100 cells, what's the percentage? However many I count, right? If I count 50 cells out of 100, what's my percentage? 50. Why do you think we count 100 cells? We ain't dumb. Okay. Characteristics for um, ID, we're going to go into that a lot more. Okay. RBC morphology, we're going to go into that a lot more. We're going to describe what our red cells look like. And we're also going to talk about platelets and get a semi-qualitative platelet estimate. Adequate, decreased, increased. Yeah, there's platelets. Nope, no platelets in there. Or, oh my God, look at all those platelets. Pretty much all you're going to be doing on that one. Okay. RBC morphology. The 
these should be small. They're about 80 to 100 femtoliters, right? And what value would tell us that? MCD. MCD. The MCD is going to tell us, okay? They should be round. That's the normal shape of a red cell. There are biconcave discs, since I only have 2D photography, sorry, I don't have the fancy stuff. If you think of a ball that somebody squished, they look more like a donut. Okay? They look like a donut. What happens is the last step of maturation, they kick out the nucleus. So they've got this hole here where the nucleus went. That lets them deform and kind of blob through. I will refer to these a lot, and I think I did when you guys were in NLT 102. It's like a water balloon. Okay, they're little red water balloons. That's going to give you a squishy. Okay. About a quarter of the area is central pallor. Well, that's what the book says. Sometimes there's a lot, sometimes there's a little, sometimes there's not so much. They should, uh, the biggest point about them is they should be fairly uniform. You know, Amanda's cells might not look like Chris's cells, but they should. Amanda's cells should all look the same, and Chris's cells should all look the same, okay? So, you really, they should be fairly homogeneous. They should be fairly boring, okay? In this class, anything that's not boring, well, that's fun for us, it's usually not very good for the patients. Actually, in this field, oh, you gotta see this, they're gonna die for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't mean that in an evil way, but <laughs> but yeah, when things get exciting for us, it's usually like, oh, no. <laughs> We're excited because of the experience to get to see it, but not, yeah. So we're going to talk about first the variation in cell size. This is referred to as anisocytosis. You will need to know that word, <laughs> okay, because we're going to use it all the time. So in anisocytosis, what we're looking at is a difference between the size of the cells. If they're great big, they're macrocytes. If they're real big, they're microcytes. Okay. The microcytes and macrocytes refers to the actual size of the cells, but anisocytosis, this is what I was talking about, the RDW, yesterday. The RDW is that SD, whatever. The one I just let the instrument spit out. We ain't going to calculate it. Okay. That RDW, if it is increased, I am going to look to see. I am going to expect anisocytosis. Okay. And again, it's not, the anisocytosis is not whether they're big or small, but whether they're all the same size. Variations in color. Normal chromic, that means they have the central area of pallor. Notice you can't really see the central pallor in all of them. This is not significant. They're donuts. Am I looking at it like this with the hole in the middle or am I looking at it from the side? Okay, so got to keep in mind 3D concept, 2D pictures. Hypochromic, hypo anything means what? Decreased. So, hypo, decreased, chrome, color. Gosh, could you have guessed that without a, without a, if I had put that picture up and given you the, the word choices, you probably could have guessed it, right? Low color. Basically, this just means there's not enough hemoglobin in each cell. And the indice that's going to be associated with that is going to be our MCHC. The MCH doesn't really tell us a lot about our morphology and what we're going to see on the slide. Because the MCH just tells us how much hemoglobin is in the cell, right? What does the MCHC tell us? What parameters do I use to calculate it? You can look at hemoglobin. Hemoglobin in. What did you say the other one? H and H, right, your, your hematocrit and your hemoglobin, you take the hemoglobin and divide it by the hematocrit. Yeah. So why would we do that? Well, because if I have little bitty cells, should they have less hemoglobin than if I have great big cells? Yes, right? Little bitty people 
have less blood. Great big people have more blood, right? It's just a size thing. Okay? You would expect more hemoglobin if my cells are bigger. What the MCHC does by putting the hematocrit and the hemoglobin in the same equation is to tell us, does it have the right amount of hemoglobin for the size that it is? Okay? So if my MCHC is low, it means I don't have enough hemoglobin based on the size that my cells are. Okay? So if my MCHC is below 30, I'm going to look for hypochromasia because it means that my cells, whether they're big, little, or normal, don't have enough hemoglobin in them. Okay. We're going to use this to differentiate anemias. Okay. A spherocyte. A spherocyte is a water balloon that somebody overfilled. It doesn't dent. There is no central area. It is round. It's a ball. Okay? And pictures of it are really hard to tell because, again, 2D pictures, 3D. And I just got a 2D camera. I can't push for the 3D one yet. Okay. All right. Spherocytes in, have too much hemoglobin for the size of the cell. So what, in, what index is going to indicate what? Oops, try this again. What is going to happen to the MCHC if I have a spherocyte? It goes higher. It goes higher. It's going to be higher usually than 36 or 37. However, what did I tell you yesterday about the MCHC? What's the most common cause of it being elevated? Hmm? No, we're going to assume it was calculated correctly. Lipemia, right. Lipemia. Okay, that's the question that was on like five tests before all the students got it. Let's see if we can get it in one. Right. <laughs> so if you have a high MCHC, yes, it could mean you have spherocytes. More likely, it means that you have uh, lipemia or a terror. Polychromasia, many colored, simply means that they're kind of blue. They're associate, associated with reticulocytes, and we'll get into those when we talk about red cells. Okay? But they shouldn't be blue. Now, if all of your cells are blue, what's wrong? Too much stain. Yeah, I stained it badly. If some of my cells are blue, that's okay. Okay? So, anisocytosis is a variation in cell size. Poikilocytosis is a variation in cell shape. We're going to report the predominant types. We're going to do it semi-quantitative. In other words, I'm not going to count how many there are. Um, rare, few, moderate, many. We aren't going to spend hours and hours on morphology, ladies and gentlemen. If it doesn't come out and bite you in the nose, it's not there. Okay. Seth, maybe it's just decides, so we'll talk about those later. But I can say rare. Um, I, there were students who wanted criteria. Well, I have to have criteria for how to do Okay, in your uh, procedure on how to do a differential, I made up some criteria. Okay, if about, I figured, well, we got rare, few, moderate, and many. So if maybe a quarter of your cells are, that's rare. If more than a quarter, less than half, that's few. More than half, less than three quarters, we'll call that moderate. And if most or all of them, we'll call that many. Okay? Truthfully, it, it's, and again, it's just doing it on and on and on until, and I will tell you the truth, it depends on how busy you are. The busier you are, the less morphology you report. When we used to do them on paper, you stopped reporting when you ran out of room to write. Okay? One of anything is not significant. <gasps> I saw a spherocyte. That's nice. Did you see any more? No. Can you find that one again? No. It ain't significant. Okay. One of anything is not significant. These things are, whew, it's so hard to remember their names. These are called ovalocytes. 
I know you're going to have a hard time with that one on the test, <laughs> aren't you? Um, the echinocytes are more commonly called burr cells. Okay. And if you get a really good one, and I have a better picture that I just haven't managed to import into here yet. You ever been out in the woods and you get those cockle burrs, either on you or on your dog? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's exactly what these things look like. They look like little cockle burrs because these little spikes are not just around the edges, they're all over here too. They're on the front side of it as well. Okay. Acanthocytes, well, they're a little difficult um, to tell, but basically they've got little spiny projections out of them. And one of the most difficult things is to tell the difference between acanthocytes and schistocytes. A schistocyte is actually a torn cell. These have an intact membrane, but they do not have, um, they don't have a torn. They have pokey things sticking out, but they're not torn. Okay? And again, practice will teach you that. And here's our first, this is my mouse. Someone's we get very bored. I, I used to give points for happy face, smiley face, uh, segs, because you find them all the time. But students were spending too much time looking for the happy face and not enough time counting the cells. Schistocyte. These are broken, and it's, I, I probably need to move it so that both the, both the schistocytes and the acanthocytes are on the same cell. But if you notice, this is probably actually an acanthocyte, because notice the membrane is actually intact. But can you see how this is actually torn? This is shredded into pieces, okay? There's my duck and my beaver. This used to be the only schistocyte picture I have, so students were like, oh, it's the duck, it's a schistocyte. Not all schistocytes look like a duck, sorry guys. But they're shreds, they're pieces, literally shredded red cells, that's what schistocytes are. Blister cells are very, very rare. What these are, they look like They've got a, like a blister or a zit popping off on the side of them. Okay? They're not real common, but they are out there. Sickle cells, they're pointy on each end. We'll talk about why later. Okay? But a sickle cell is just that. It looks like it's been elongated and it's got points on the end. Right. Hemoglobin C crystals. They look like crystals, like you would go and buy a little piece of quartz crystal or whatever your, your crystal of choice is. They are literally crystals that precipitate within the cell. They have sharp edges. They have straight lines. Hence, almost nothing in biology is a straight line. Okay. There's very few truly straight lines in biology. That's almost all chemistry. Um, so you do see these, and I actually have two cases uh, with hemoglobin C crystals, and all of my slides came, well, 90% of my slides came from our hospital. So these are things that have happened around here. This isn't something I imported from Zimbabwe or something. Okay. Teardrop cells, uh, it looks more like a pear, but basically it does, it just looks like a teardrop, okay? And so they, teardrop cells are also known as dacrocytes. Um, that one I'm probably not going to test you on dacrocytes. Because if somebody asks me, I'm like, Ugh. Sickle cells are drapanocytes. Did I put that on the slide? Yeah. Sickle cells are drapanocytes. That one you might want to know. Stomatocytes. They call them that because they look like they have a mouth. This one looks like those wax lips you used to get when you're, I don't know if you did we used to get wax lips that you, anyway. But they look like a mouth. 90% of the time, 99% of the time, they're an artifact. In other words, the slide wasn't made properly. If you really think you have stomatocytes, it's a very serious disease, and you need to go back and you need to remake the slide very carefully and stain it very carefully. 99% of the time, those stomatocytes will go away. Okay. Target cells, these are also known as codocytes, and you probably ought to know that one. They look like a target, like a bullseye, like you'd shoot an archery target. Okay, again, that, that's a tough one to remember. Looks like a target, it's a target cell. Agglutination, this would be 
if you were in a proper counting area. And notice if they don't, they're not in strings, they're not stacked up like coins, they're globbed together in big bunches. And we'll talk about what causes that later because there's multiple causes. But if you do that, you need to investigate your red count because it's probably wrong. A nucleated red blood cell, which is often put out as an NRBC, and when I was in school we called them nervies, so I call them nervies, I'm sorry. Um, but they are a nucleated red blood cell, and when we talk about maturation, these are young, these are babies, okay? The last step before they go out into the great white world is the nucleus comes out. So if they're in your bloodstream with the nucleus still in them, you're releasing some pretty young uh, red cells. Basophilic stippling. Um, it just looks like it's got the measles, the blue measles. Again, we'll talk about what those are. How do jolly bodies, everybody, everybody I know calls them holly jolly bodies. You just, you just can't help yourself. But how old jolly bodies are a large single purple dot. They're a remnant of DNA, where for some reason a little bit of the nucleus just stuck around. Um, cabot rings, I'm going to stick, skip over. I have never seen one in real life. I had to steal the pictures from the internet. There's, there's not, they're not something you really see. And we've had the disease states that they're associated with, and I've still never seen one. <laughs> um, Pappenheimer bodies, we see those all the time. They're small, and they're usually clustered together, and there's a few of them. And I came up a few years ago with a stupid memory device. The way I tell the difference, and I need to move the slides, I know. The how jolly bodies are like you got shot with a rifle. One, maybe two nice, clean holes. Pappenheimer bodies, that's more like a shotgun blast. And what are Pappenheimer bodies? They're siderotic or iron granules. I don't know if it helps you remember it. If it doesn't, ignore me. Pines bodies, again, I've never seen these. And you will only see these, this is very important, you will only see these on super vital stain, which we use to stain retics. You will not see these on the peripheral blood in a normal right stain smear. These only show up in a retic slide. Okay. We already talked about all of that. Platelet morphology, small chunks. You can have large platelets, you can have giant platelets. That's all I'm talking about, platelets. Or all about, I'm going to talk about normal platelets. Platelet clumps, that's when you have the platelets aggregating together. What's that a precursor to? Clotting. So why do you think we see platelet clumps most of the time? Because the blood was getting ready to clot and they got it mixed just in time. Unfortunately, the analyzer would count this as one. It would count this probably it's a white cell, it would count this as one. So if you've got platelet clumps on your slide, you're going to see an artificially decreased platelet clump count. Yes? Going back, what's a retic? A retic is a immature, um, nucleated red, or an immature red blood cell, and we use a different stain to count them. We'll get more into them later, okay? but it is a different stain. That's the biggest point right there. Okay. Um, if we see a lot of these very small clumps, clumps of three to seven, but they're just sort of everywhere, that's probably not a clotted specimen. It's an artifact. Some people, and we don't know why, or well, maybe somebody knows why. I don't know why, and frankly, it's not that big of a piece of my life that I care to look it up. In EDTA, their platelets begin to aggregate. But the thing is, you're going to see small platelet clumps distributed everywhere. You start seeing great big platelet clumps, it's because the specimen was clotting. Okay. 
in order to take care of these little platelet clumps, you can redraw the patient a thousand times and it's not going to make it any better. We'll actually wind up drawing them in sodium citrate and again, sorry I gotta keep putting you off, but we will get to that later. This is platelet satellitism. They're like little moons and for some reason they line up right around the outside of the neutrophil like it's satellites, okay? That was exciting, wasn't it? Yes. That was the all, because um, I don't think we have half the slides for the uh, examination of the peripheral smears. That's not the one that's up? Um, no. Yeah, we have until the characteristics of the IV um, cells. None of the morphology. None of the morphology no, yeah. is up, okay? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. When we get done here, I will print new ones for all of you. Tell, okay, how many of you want it in a four cell, four cell, four slide format? How many want it in a six slide format? Okay. I changed my mind. No, if you prefer four, it's easy enough. Can I have four too then? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just because we're pictures. Did you want four or do you want six? I got one. Oh. With those. Those came out. It should right. be the we updated from this morning. Right. right. It's not, there's not messed up. Yeah. We got all the slides. Hmm. See, I just pulled it up on the computer and it's not showing. Mine is exactly what I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, I just put mine this morning. How come some of you got it? So I didn't change yeah. it between last night and this morning. Yeah, she, they <laughs> printed out on PowerPoint and we printed out from the PDF Oh, you printed page. off the PDF page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, I'll just print them out and give them to you. Okay, it'll just make me happier. It'll make it easier for me to figure out. Okay. All right, are you guys up for one more? I'm afraid yesterday's presentation really put us behind and I don't want to get too far behind. Okay, I'd rather push you a little bit this week, a little bit next week, than get to the end of this and be trying to teach you all about anemia in two days. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get through the easy stuff, because this is the easy stuff. Okay, all right. Leukocyte morphology and function. Leukocyte is simply a fancy name for white blood cells. Normal white cells. We have a segmented neutrophil, an eosinophil, a lymphocyte, a monocyte, and a basophil. These are the five primary cells that we're going to find in human blood. When I teach you how to differentiate, and the first question I'm going to ask you is, is it a granulocyte or not? If it's a granulocyte, it's going to have granules in the cytoplasm. The neutrophil granules are going to be pink to very light blue, and this is going to vary a great deal based on what stain and what, how you stain the slide, okay? So there are different brands, there are different stainers. Um, if you're doing it manually, it can make a difference. So how do I tell if it's a neutrophil if there aren't really good granules that I can see? It's easy, go find a seg. It's the one with the lobulated nucleus. Nothing else has a nucleus that looks like that. Once you find a seg, you now know what the cytoplasm of all of your granulocytes look like. Okay, and how will you find a seg? It's easy, it's the most abundant cell on the slide. And we'll go over this again when we do it in lab. The eosinophils are going to have nice, big, round, orange granules. Okay. Not only are they going to be orange, but they're going to be distinct and round. They look like little seeds in the cytoplasm. The granules in a neutrophil, they're more diffuse. They're smaller. They're not as distinct. In the eosinophil, they're round. They're large. The granules themselves are large and they're definitely orange. If in doubt, what are you going to do? Ask or restate the slide. Okay. Basophils, those have big blue black granules. They're very, very large. A lot of times you can't even see the nucleus. Some of the older slides that I have in there, you will never see a basophil because the stain we had didn't stain them. They're not real common anyway. Um, but just, just beware that every once in a while you'll come across a cell that looks really weird, and I'll tell you it's a basophil, 
even though it doesn't have the blue black granules that's just because it's a stain related issue okay they're going to have a segmented nucleus truly pulled into little pieces okay the a granulocytes or the mononuclear cells the cytoplasm is going to be from a light to a dark blue and the nucleus is not segmented it's going to be continuous and round and well mostly round The SEG, also known as a poly, or the segmented neutrophil, also known as a SEG, a poly, or a PMN. And I have heard them referred to by all of those terms within the last two years. Some of the older, uh, older texts will call them polys, and you need to know what they're talking about. Dr. Calls down and wants to know about PMNs, you need to know what he's talking about. So you need to know all the names for it. It is the most common white cell on a normal differential, and we're talking about normal differentials today. Um, anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. One of the big things I try to stress when we're teaching differentials, and I'll ask you this a thousand times before the end of the semester, differentials are not about numbers. Whether you have 40 or 43 percent neutrophils, doesn't matter. Differentials are about ratios. How many neutrophils do I have in relation to how many lymphocytes I have? We're counting 100 cells, so if I count more neutrophils, what's going to happen to my lymphocyte count? Down. I'm only counting 100. So if I've got excess neutrophils, something else has to drop down because it's always got to add up to 100. Okay, so differentials are about ratios. The description, I put the size on there because everybody puts the size on there. That's never going to be a determining factor for you. Okay, so if you don't remember how big things are, I don't remember till I look at the slides again. The biggest piece here is it's going to be a lobulating nucleus. They're going to actually be pinched off into small globs, okay? We're going to do our first diff next week. By the time you're done with your second diff, you'll know a SEG. You won't even have to think about it, SEG. Okay. It has a clumped chromatin. And what is chromatin? Um, it's rhetorical. The chromatin is the purple stuff, okay? And basically, I can't draw over spot, but here's my nucleus, okay? If it's very fine, okay, this is what we're going to see. This is what I refer to as fine chromatin, okay? It's very, very smooth. There's not a lot of clumping to it, okay? This is what you're going to see in very young cells. And again, we're going to do pictures till you're ready to puke. Clumped is going to be dark. There's not going to be a lot of area between it. You're not going to be able to see through it. It's going to be really dark and really dense. Okay? If you look at the picture very, very closely, you can even see there's areas that are much deeper and much denser than the others. We're going to do a lot of these. On the scope, we're going to talk about chromatin. We are going to go through this a thousand times, I promise. Okay? This looks like somebody with a colored pencil. My niece, who's an artist, does this. This looks like my granddaughter got hold of it. Okay? So, clumped chromatin. The primary function, and you will need to be able to match these up, the primary function of our neutrophils, they are active in bacterial infections. And they are also a very important part of the inflammatory response, which we will talk about in um, serology this fall. Okay? But it is important to remember that if your body's just having some sort of inflammatory reaction, you're going to have an increase in neutrophils. Okay? The band neutrophil, aka band or they still call them stops, okay? Um, I don't know why, they just did. And again, if they're talking about it, you need to know those names, 
because there are going to people, be people who refer to them by both names. It looks just like a say, except that if you look here, there is always chromatin between the two sides. It never pinches off. Okay. I've had to really loosen up my criteria on bands because I was over, I was overly tight with it, and some of our clinicals were saying, oh, they don't ever call bands, and bands are present. This is one of the hardest cells to deal with when you're calling, when you're doing differentials. The main be reason being is that there is such huge inconsistency in the way people call bands. CAP, which is the uh, registered, uh, accrediting agency for laboratories, sends out unknown samples, survey samples, and they send out pictures. In the 1990s, they sent out, I think, five, three or five sets of 100 pictures each set, okay, with bands, SEGs, and bandy SEGs, or SEGI bands, okay, some that were definitively SEGs, some that were definitively bands, and others that were eh, kind of questionable. They were hoping to be able to get a consensus. Everybody called the SAGs, SAGs. Everybody called the bands, bands. The stuff in the middle <laughs> was a statistician's nightmare. There was absolutely no consensus. There was absolutely, they couldn't even narrow down a little bit. So when you're calling bands, the most important part is that you are calling them the same way everybody else in your lab is calling them. So if you get to your clinical site or you get to a job and they say, oh, there's a lot more bands than that, loosen up your criteria, count more bands. If they say, oh, no, that's not a band, it's not good enough, tighten up your criteria. I teach you towards the tight end, but the problem is that an increase in bands could mean an infection or a problem. So you don't want a doctor getting a report today because you counted the differential and you count bands one way and tomorrow you count the differential and the band count went up not because there's more bands but because you are just a little looser in your criteria than you are. Okay? So consistency across your text within a lab is more important on bands than definitive criteria. CAP in five years and literally hundreds of thousands of cells could not get a consensus. Some hospitals and some laboratories actually chose to stop reporting bands at all. They just include them with the neutrophils. Okay. Because it was such an area of contention. Eosinophil, aka EOS, Oh, and the function on the bands is the same as on the sex. You're going to see between 1 and 3% of these. They're pretty. Once you've seen your first one, that's all it takes. You'll recognize them right away. They're pretty. They're orange. Can you see what I'm saying about the granules, how they're very, very distinct, round? They look like little seeds in here. These tend to have only like two lobes. They tend to be bilobed or not even really lobulated a lot, but it's, you're not going to mix them up with anything else because nothing else has orange. Okay. Eosinophils, um, they are their primary function. They are active in hypersensitivity. What's hypersensitivity? Allergies. Allergies. Okay. Somebody comes in with a 45% EO count, huh, they're sneezing. Okay. They are also active in parasitic infections. This is a good time to, to bring up diagnosing. There's an old saying in diagnosis, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. So if somebody comes in with a high EO count in your lab in the middle of central Illinois, your mind should not drunk, jump to parasites. It should probably start with allergies. Does that make sense? And believe me, we will use the term zebra. Uh, they bought me a zebra stamp last year, two years ago. After she graduated, she found a zebra stamp somewhere and she sent it to me. Here's your zebra stamp. Yes? I might be something stupid here, but are they one of the phagocytic ones? No. 
No. Why do they attack parasites then? The granules contain antihistamines. The granules so contain. So you're having an allergic reaction to the mm -hmm. parasites. They're, they're cited. They're toxic. <coughs> it's it's chemical warfare. Okay. That's our. Um, what about basophil? Did I leave out the basophil? Seriously, Diane Marie. I left out the basophil. How do I get rid of the basophil? Okay, well, the basophil, if you see one, that's nice. You're not usually going to see very many. If we have elevated eosinophils, we will frequently see a couple basophils. They have the dark blue black granules in there. And basophils basically are not very active in the bloodstream. They're usually just hitching a ride to where they're going because basophils go into the cells, into the tissues, and become mast cells and release histamines. Okay? So you do need to remember that basophils become mast cells. Right? And that is their active form. Okay? The basophils are like the last step to severe allergy. Yes. That's why you don't see them normally. That's why you don't see them normally. You do see a slight increase once the EOs, the EOs start going up. And we will, in anaphylactic reactions where you know, you've got a 70 or 80% eosinophil, we'll start seeing um, a lot more basophils. The monocytes, its, it's nickname is pretty boring. It's just a monocyte. Uh, 2 to 11 percent, that's nice, okay. You got lots of neutrophils, here and there you see an EO, sometimes you see a baso. you're going to see a handful of monos, okay. They're a little bit larger, they have a round or slightly not lobulated nucleus with fine chromatin. Okay, it's not as clumped, it's not as dense, it's not as dark as what we see in our, our granulocytes. Okay. We're going to see, they're, they're kind of amorphous, blobby little things. Many of them have vacuoles, not all of them, it'd be really nice if they did. Okay. The, hor the nucleus is described in literature as a horseshoe shape. They unfortunately have not gotten the memo out in the real world, so they're not always that shape. Um, they have an abundant gray-blue cytoplasm that may have pseudopods or vacuoles. Um, telling the difference between a monocyte and a lymphocyte is the most difficult thing that we will have to learn on differentials. And there's honestly times we pull out a coin and flip it. Yep, uh, we're going to call it a mono. I call the last one a mono, we'll call this one a lymph. Okay. It is very, very difficult at times. And that's because our next cell is a pain in the butt. The monocytes, again, these are not that, they are active in the bloodstream, but much more importantly, their active form is the macrophage in the tissues and in the fluids. These are the garbage men. Okay, macro means what? Large. And what does phage mean? To eat. They're large eaters. That's what they do. They go into the tissues and they munch up the dead cells. They go into the tissues and they eat the bacteria. Um, once they get into the cells, we actually call them by what they ate. So if they ate a leukocyte, we call them leukophages. If they ate an erythrocyte, we call them erythrophages. Guess what it is if they munched on bacteria for breakfast? Bacteriophage, yeah, don't make them difficult. If they ate lipids, lipophage. <laughs> don't make it harder than it is. But the biggest thing is these guys go into the tissues and do the cleanup. They take and they munch up all of the dead cells and stuff. They then return to the liver, the spleen, and various other portions of the body and break down all the stuff into its component parts. Okay. The lymphocyte, the lowly, lowly lymphocyte. This is about a quarter to a half of your cells. One thing you do want to remember that is in children, this is a much higher percentage. 
It can be as high as 60 or 70 percent in kids, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Okay, children just have a normally higher lymphocyte count. Okay, that's perfectly, perfectly acceptable. I, I love that we have a beautiful description of them. Frankly, when it gets right down to it, what can a lymphocyte look like? Any damn thing wants to. These guys are just, they are masters of disguise. And it makes life real fun and exciting. When they're like this, they're small, basically barely bigger than a red cell. They have a very dense chromatin. This one's actually even finer than what I would normally see. I mean, it's really dark, really, really dark purple. Scant cytoplasm, there's times you can't even see the cytoplasm on these things. There's so little to it. We like those lips. Oh, look, yay! Yeah, be nice, wouldn't it? Their primary function, what right now, we're not going to worry too much about T cells and B cells. I'll kill you with that this fall, okay? Right now, what I want you to hook them up with is viral infection. Your lymphocytes are what's going to be protecting you in a viral infection. So if I have a patient with a high lymphocyte count, my thought's probably going to go viral. Either is it a child or do they have a viral infection? That's the most common. Reactive lymphocytes, I could fill this entire screen with all the things that they could look like. All of those at the top, I know it's a drawing out of, it's out of Diggs manual, I know I gotta cite my sources. But you can get ones that have like little hooky things, and you can get great big blue ones, and you can get fuzzy ones, and you can get some that have purple dots in them, and pretend to be granulocytes. I'm not kidding you, these things are a pain in the butt. How are you gonna learn to tell the difference? I promise you will, because you're going to do slide after slide, after slide, after slide, after slide. And you're going, Melissa, Diane, <laughs> okay? And you're going to ask us every one for the first few times. We're used to that. Do not ever hesitate to call us over. I had one student who was ashamed to admit she didn't know what stuff was. She got to the end of the course and couldn't do a diff. Don't let that happen, for goodness sakes. We're here to help you. And honestly, there's going to be times I'm going to come over and look. Oh, that's nice. Seen any more of them? Oh, you have. Oh, me too. We're getting rid of that slide. Okay. So they do change in shape. One of the things we often see with our abnormal or atypical limbs or our reactive limbs, they get big. This is bigger than a normal. This would be more of a normal limb. They get big. And one of the things doesn't always work, but is, is a good indicator. If it is go, coming up next to the red cells, hey buddy, how you doing? And it's getting nice and dark right around where it's coming up next to the red cells. That is where antigenic stimulation is occurring. So if it looks like that, it's 99% going to be a lymph, but an atypical lymph. It sounds absolutely horrible now. I know, I promise, no one has ever died from trying to tell the difference between limbs and monos. A couple have wanted to, but so far none of them have ever actually succumbed. Okay? But what can they look like? Anything they want. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're horrible. So basically, a lot of times it's ruled out. Is it a mono? If you can tell it's a mono for sure, yay. If you can't, well, I guess we're going to call it a limb. And I will tell you, honestly, we had one patient came in. We called 90-some per, or 80-some percent uh, monocytes on that patient for the first three weeks they were there. They went for flow cyto cell cytometry. The next day, we started calling them lymphocytes, including our pathologist. Including our pathologist. He looked at him and he says, oh, this is weird. This is a really, these look like monos. They definitively had horseshoe-shaped nucleus, it had vacuoles in them, and we called them monocytes. And sure enough, we got back the flow cell cytometry and they were actually lymphoma cells. And so we had to turn around in a hurry and call them something different. So sometimes, sometimes you're wrong. But as long as you don't miss the difference between a monocyte 
and a blast. Not a good. We don't want to tell them that they are having some sort of necrotic disease instead of leukemia. Don't want to miss leukemia. That's a bad, bad. They get upset when you miss leukemia. Or when you call leukemia and it's not there. They get even madder about that. Questions, problems? All right, what I would like to do in the lab today, and since I'm the boss, is what we're going to do. Um, Amanda, by virtue of not being here yesterday, you elected yourself <laughs> to be our first XN trainee. <laughs> so I'm going to show you how to do the maintenance and everything on it. If we get to it today, great. If we don't, we will do it tomorrow. Okay. okay? But that way I don't have to show you what I showed them yesterday. It actually will just save us a little bit of time. And I was just going to pull names out of hat, so <laughs> you came out of that. Dear. 